Mr. Eisenhower had approved a project involving the development of an extremely high altitude aircraft to be used for surveillance and intelligence collection over denied areas in Europe, Russia, and elsewhere. We had, on the basis of Kelly's proposal, an almost impossible schedule to meet. It was almost impossible for Lockheed, but I can assure you that it was also an extremely tight schedule working within the bureaucracy. The mission of the plane to overfly the USSR dictated several things. First, it would have to fly very high to be outside the range of interceptors and anti-aircraft weapons. It would also need a very long range. There would obviously be no fuel stops en route. These two aims complemented each other. Being out of range, the plane did not need to go particularly fast and could cruise economically. The shape which emerged was that of a glider with extraordinarily large high aspect wings and reflecting an obsession with weight conservation. The prototype arrived at the Groom Lake test site on the 29th of July, 1955. Kelly Johnson's impossible self-imposed schedule was met. The plane flew on time. As part of the secrecy, the designation U-2 was intended to give nothing away. The U stood ambiguously for utility. In fact, the U-2 has performed many roles in addition to its primary espionage function, and the word utility has proved over time to actually be a fair description. The U-2 is a demanding plane to fly. There are many things about maneuvering this powered glider in extremely thin air at great altitude that are not applicable to flying any other aircraft. For example, at altitude there is only a very narrow envelope between its stall speed and its entry into transonic flight, the point at which supersonic airflow over the wings begins. In the U-2 at 70,000 feet, these two points were about 12 knots apart. Below 400 knots, you would fall out of the sky looking for denser air. Above 412 knots, your wings might come off. This is a very restricting slot to occupy. Over the years, with increased load and more powerful engines, the gap actually narrowed to less than 5 miles per hour. Given the stresses of the missions and the fragile nature of the planes, Kelly Johnson did not expect the U-2 to have a long lifespan, particularly when the frustrated Soviets concentrated their attention on knocking it down, as they most certainly would. However, the design has proved to be enduring, and the very unusual step was taken in 1979 of restarting production, and the plane was rechristened the TR-1. The TR-1 maintains the design and abilities of the U-2. The aircraft that Kelly Johnson's team produced provided a solution that is as valid today as it was in 1954. Of course, optical cameras are no longer the primary loads of U-2s or TR-1s, which now fly electronic and communications intelligence missions using their high flying capability and small size. But these technological spying measures were not the original reason for the U-2s. And in the 50s, that reason, to overfly Russian territory, carrying cameras and taking photos, was a priority. 
But as the likelihood of the Russians developing weapons to shoot U-2s down increased, so did the urgency of replacing them. A new plane was needed, one that could fly much faster. If one was no longer protected by being out of range of interception, then one needed to be able to outrun it. About a year after that first flight in, 50, in 1956, uh, I came to the conclusion that we should start working on the successor to the U-2 because it was clear to me that sooner or later the U-2 would be vulnerable to interception. It was not a matter of simply commissioning the final design and production of an aircraft that was within, although at the edge of the state of the art, as had been the case with the U-2. This time, it was a real a really pioneering effort. The U-2's replacement was equipped with four large equipment bays to handle a wide range of specialized reconnaissance and surveillance gear. Mission equipment included side-looking radar, a terrain objective camera, two operational objective cameras, two technical objective cameras, and infrared mapping, mission recorders, and an EMR system. The airframe is essentially a blended body and delta wing built around two huge engines. The long forward fuselage performs a number of aerodynamic functions. Its flat profile helps the Blackbird achieve a low radar visibility while retaining plenty of room for fuel and payload. The chines on the fuselage effectively make it act as a lifting surface and help improve directional stability. The enormous engines are positioned midway out on the wing and are housed in nacelles that have unique intake systems to control airflow. This is a critical factor in generating the plane's amazing power. Because of the Blackbird's speed, its wings are very thin, and a large part of their area is taken up with a honeycomb of fuel storage. But most of the fuel is carried in five tanks that occupy the majority of the fuselage. It's worth noting that in 1958, when the plane was first being developed, even the most advanced fighter designs of the day were flat out at Mach 2. They had ranges and operating ceilings that were hopelessly short of the espionage requirement. Everything about this new plane would be revolutionary. There would be new materials for the aircraft's parts, and even the machines to make the materials and parts would have to be developed from scratch. Lockheed had some experience with titanium fabrication, but this would be only a starting point for the metals needed for the job. The plane would have to withstand very high temperatures for long periods. Different areas of the skin would be between 800 and 1100 degrees Fahrenheit at Mach 3. As a result, despite the expense of the material and the research and development costs of inventing it, around 93% of the plane is composed of a titanium alloy. 